name is Jasmine Gann, and I'm the Australian Outlook Editor, um, which is a blog of the Australian Institute of International Affairs. So today I'm really happy to be joined by Professor Penelope Matthews from the Griffith Law School and also Pro Associate Professor Savitri Taylor from La Trobe University. Thank you for joining me. Thanks for having us. Yes. No <laughs> so today, um, Penelope, you gave an excellent presentation on Australia and uh, Australia and the rules of people movement and the human rights law at the Australia and Rules Based International Order Conference hosted by the AAA. And so much for you, I really enjoyed your comments as discussant today. So uh, Penelope, I understand that you spent some time in Geneva during the drafting of the Global Compacts for Migration and um, Refugees. Mm -hmm. Uh, I wonder if you could also weigh in a bit and give us your view, um, perhaps, on the New York Declaration for Refugees and... Um yes, yes. So, the New York Declaration on Refugees and Migrants, or for Refugees and Migrants, was adopted uh, in September 2016, and it set in train this process of negotiating two global compacts, uh, one on refugees and one for safe, orderly and regular migration. Um, the New York Declaration certainly isn't perfect, so that, you know there are some points that have attracted criticism. But on the whole, I was quite excited about this document. Um, it, it makes a number of non-binding uh, commitments, and so it says that the member states will commit to a more equitable uh, sharing of the responsibility and burdens for protecting of protecting refugees. And they talk about offering more uh, safe migration pathways, both for refugees and in principle other people uh, on the move. Um, and that is just a, a much more progressive move than these unilateral deterrence mechanisms that we've seen states adopt, um, where you know we have interdiction or we have carrier sanctions on airlines uh, and basically borders are externalised. So I thought it was a fairly positive document, non-binding, but you, in principle, it's a consensus uh, document. You've got the agreement of the 193 UN member states, more or less. I mean, consensus at the General <laughs> Assembly does cover paper over a few disagreements. But on the whole, um, a really positive development. Uh, and as part of the New York Declaration, um, they, they set out the uh, idea of a comprehensive refugee response framework and acknowledging that not every refugee crisis can be dealt with in exactly the same way and that not every single durable solution will be found uh, applicable in each of those situations. Some situations might have local integration of refugees in the country of first asylum, some might have more resettlement and so on. But trying to set out what are the common elements that you want in any response to a refugee crisis. And in that framework there are things like offering a legal status in a country of first asylum to refugees. Mm -hmm. That would be an enormous step forward. Um, the declaration, there's also a commitment to um, offering more resettlement on a scale that would at least meet the annual resettlement needs identified by UNHCR. Given that currently the world only meets 10% of those um, annually identified needs, if states actually met that, um, that commitment, that would be a big move forward. So I think lots of positive things in that in that declaration. The global compacts are in draft. Uh, we expect the global compact on refugees to be adopted in about November, and then the global compact um, for migration in December in Morocco. Again, you know, they're compromise documents, and and Savitri had some really interesting points to make this morning about the way in which the various iterations of the Global Compact on Refugees uh, have changed the equation. But on the whole, really pleased to see it adopted, really pleased to see strong endorsement of the Refugee Convention as the cornerstone of refugee protection. Um, so lots of positives, I think. That's my take anyway. <laughs> so I'm sure you mentioned this morning that you compared um, the current New York a declaration to the earlier zero draft, I believe mm. it's called. So uh, what's your view on the way it's turned out? Okay, 
Well, as I said this morning, uh, the zero draft was a much more strongly worded document than the the final draft, but I guess the New York Declaration was just the starting point. I just thought that it uh, presaged, <laughs> you know, what was to come, that, um, that every iteration was going to get more and more watered down, and in my view, that's certainly what happened uh, through the iterative uh, drafting of the Global Compact on Refugees as well, that more and more language came into it about uh, national law, national priorities, state consent, state requests, state sovereignty, um, and, and the fact that none of this was prescriptive, um, which uh, basically boils down to uh, not actually promising mm. very much. Uh, but, um, you know, I would be delighted if, um, if uh, you know, if the compacts actually uh, led over time to an improvement in the situation for refugees. I'm just not holding my breath. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned in your comments earlier today that um, Currently, the developing world still bears the disproportionate burden of taking in and taking care of refugees. I think the statistic you used was still 85% compared to the developed nations. Do you think that perhaps considering um, that upholding human rights is an established part of the rules-based liberal international order, there's an inherent contradiction there and that's a problem that um, is inherent to the order? Um. It, it's certainly the case that uh, the countries that are bearing the disproportionate uh, share of the responsibility mm. for protecting refugees are the least able to do so, uh, to protect the full range of uh, economic, social, cultural, political rights. Um, and at the same time, uh, the countries in the West have found it easier, the industrialized developed countries have found it easier just to put barriers in the way of people moving um, to their gated communities uh, than um, to actually uh, contribute to improving the situation, the human rights situation of those in the developing world. So um, the sort of the domestic social compact, I guess, in Western countries is that within the borders and for citizens, human rights are upheld um, to a very high degree, uh, but uh, almost as the price for that, mm. we uh, need to keep everybody else out. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I often think of that phrase of the global apartheid. Right. That yeah. in a sense the boundaries we now have after a long history of colonisation and stripping out resources from what yeah. we've now called developing countries has left some countries less able to care for their own citizens and less able to bear the responsibility for refugees and yet they're in regions where those that inability and various other factors mean that they're more likely to be in yeah. the vicinity mm. of refugee mm. flows and so geographically they're the ones who end up with the larger responsibility. Um, and again, I, I do see positives in this process of negotiating for compacts on refugees and migrants, um, particularly in the area of migration. This is building on probably 25 years of discussions about some global governance regime for migration. Um, but until you know that time, really it's been left to every state to manage migration mm -hmm. on its own. So it seems to me there really is a concerted push to try and even up the scales a bit and, um, and, and to try and, and recognise the relationship between migration and development in a, mm -hmm. in a more sustained way. And so the Global Compact uh, for Migration actually says this is rooted mm -hmm. in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable mm -hmm. Development and it's about 
leaving no person behind. We want mm. to try and even things up again. And we recognise that then there might not be such a, a need for people to migrate. It's a complex relationship. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but on the whole, I think I'm encouraged that states are actually having these mm. kinds of discussions and thinking about it in, in this way. I think it's a positive mm. development. Right. Thank mm. you. So now to more, I suppose, a practical question. So considering the US has just recently slashed its resettlement quota for refugees as part of a wider trend towards US isolationism, what role should Australia have, do you think, in upholding the future rules-based international order and also towards working towards, as you say, the UN 2030 agenda? Well, I, I do think that when the US has retreated in the way that it has mm. under the Trump administration, it's incumbent on the rest of us to actually step up to the mm. plate and show leadership. And, and I think Australia has a long engagement with mm. multilateral for a very clever diplomatic core, very capable. So we're capable of playing a role. Uh, what worries me, um, and the point was made, I think, you know, critically of me this morning, and I think fair enough that we, the, we, we have a proud tradition in migration and there are lots of good practices that we can share. Mm -hmm. But I would still uh, argue that on the, the front of spontaneous asylum seeking, particularly people who arrive by boat, we're sending all the wrong messages. Mm. We're not leading. Um, in fact, we're encouraging a race to the bottom. And as I documented in my, on my paper this morning, um, there are quite chilling references to Australian practice, both mm. in the EU documentation, this latest um, council meeting where they were discussing what to do after Italy had refused to disembark two boatloads of asylum seekers, uh, the EU says of the current EU-Turkey agreement and, and where it's going with all of this is that, you know, we've broken the people smugglers business model and we're saving lives. Mm. And you just think, well, that is Australia's <laughs> language being used <laughs> there. And they then talk about having uh, a, a extraterritorial or regional disembarkation uh, centres and the concern is, well, is this going to be a helpful thing where you try and impose some order and channel people towards the EU, or is it just a containment device, rather like the Pacific Solution, Manus and Nauru, where until President Obama said, we will take some of those people, people were just left there for years on end. Uh, and similarly, even with the United States, where, you know, to be fair, most of this agenda has just been driven by the Trump uh, administration's willingness to, to pander to its, its mm -hmm. base, you again see some of our language being picked up on and used. So when the US mission announced that it was withdrawing from the Global Compact uh, for Migration, Ambassador Nikki Haley said something like, we decide who will come into this country, you know, and it was just evident that they picked up on the language uh, of Prime Minister Howard again. Um, you know, and I just uh, think that you, you can't erect a gigantic wall right. uh, around yourself. Um, there will still be some arrivals. Uh, that, that's inevitable. It's very costly both mm. financially and in terms of the people who are towed back to wherever or put on Manus and Nauru. You can't actually sustain that as a solution any more than you can build a wall between Mexico and the United States and expect Mexico or the Congress to, to want to pay for it. It's really a very short-term um, electoral um, kind of uh, ploy rather than a long-term solution. Long-term solutions will have to be cooperative. They will have to recognise the right to seek asylum. And they will have to recognise that sometimes it is, in fact, the barriers to migration that we erect that cause desperate people to use people smugglers. So again, that's where I go back to the New York Declaration and how positive it was to see the international community saying, no, no, the response isn't to have all of the... Yeah, it's important to tackle people smuggling, but it's not about walls, it's about creating more safe pathways. To me, that was just a very positive thing in the New York Declaration. So I'm just thinking, how about any recommendations for our leaders in Canberra? <laughs> well, frankly, I don't think that 
progressive change or uh, is going to come from our leaders in Canberra. Mm. Um, I see the best hope as being in civil society mm. and I think really civil society not just in Australia but in various parts of the world and including uh, the developing world um, they just need to embark on this intergenerational project of um, of reframing the way that they see um, non-nationals, non-citizens. Um, and you know, there have been various things that seem so entrenched in, um, in the economic and other structures um, that have been shifted by civil society whether you're talking about slavery <laughs> or you're talking about women's rights or, or you're talking about marriage equality. The leadership does not come from the politicians. Mm -hmm. the, the, the leadership mm -hmm. comes from, from everyone in civil society working over decades to get the massive social shifts that then allow the politicians to lead from behind. Because <laughs> they're certainly not leading, leading from, from the, the front. front. No. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for your time today. It's been a very illuminating conversation. And if you'd like any more information about international affairs, please do check out our website.